We are live. Hello, everyone. Hope everyone is well. Happy Thursday. We're back again, January 14th. Guys, a week flies by super fast. Super excited to have everyone here um, and A, be talking about this fabulous topic here today. Children's emotional intelligence right now, I think it's the forefront of every parent, teacher, director, principal, whoever you are. It, it, it's at the forefront of everybody's mind right now, especially with, with where we're at. So settle on in, let us know how everybody's doing. Happy Thursday once again. It's um, it's just gross out today, guys. It's gray, it's overcast, it's kind of mild, but not mild at the same time. But uh, glad to see everybody coming in. Let's see who we got here. We got a lot of Toronto folks I've seen. Hello, Southwest Texas, Ottawa, Albuquerque. Welcome back, folks. I am super jazzed for our special guest today. Like, really. I, I'm so lucky to get to be able to speak with all these fabulous people. Hello, I see some more Texas, Los Angeles, California. Hello from Six Nations, Ontario. Fantastic to have everybody settling on here. A minute or two, just because we did kind of go live up a minute or two later. So I want to make sure everyone has a chance to settle in. Um, very excited. Welcome. If you've never been with us before, welcome to your first Hi Mama Helps webinar. If you've been with us for, we're on number 36, uh, welcome back. So hello, Massachusetts, you're in the house. I see you there, Stacy. welcome back. I see a couple of our regulars rolling through. Guys, the names are starting to get familiar. If you were with us last spring when we first rolled out, um, I think I might be getting better at names. That's not my, um, not my strong suit, but I do, I try, I try. We're getting there. Kaya's on chat. Folks, we're going to be giving out some some great stuff here today. I'm just so pumped. So, so pumped. So one more minute here. It's snowing out your way here, Stacey. Yeah, I know. We're supposed to get, they're, they're calling for it. It's it's supposed to get really, you know, Canadian winter here eventually. So as I put it. All right. One more minute, folks. And then let's let's start the show here. Have a sip. I got my afternoon tea. I hope you have yours. I hope everyone's staying safe and healthy. Um, I'm sure many of you know, at, at this point, Ontario just went back into its uh, second state of emergency. So I hope everyone here in Ontario is just doing their best to stay stay healthy and do as much as you can to stay happy. Um, you know, and the numbers just across are not great. So hopefully there's some light at the tunnel coming. It's a long tunnel, but we'll eventually get there. Okay. I think we should, should we rock and roll? Folks, you guys rolled in really fast here today. Um, Ms. Kaya, maybe if you want to join me here for this one. We we started this last week, but maybe enlighten us a little bit more. I'm I'm very excited about our Facebook page. Tell us more. I'm so excited too. Rhea, do you mind moving in us? You yeah, I'm going to move our square. Get myself out of the way here. It's like we're in Hollywood Squares. So uh, coming winter 2021, we are starting a brand new exclusive Facebook group. It's going to be called Circle Time, a, a term we're all, I'm sure, very familiar with. It is a amazing group that we are going to be um, having on winter 2021 on Facebook. That's where it's going to be hosted. So this is a place for you as an early childhood educator to connect with like-minded educators to share classroom ideas and resources, get those activities out there, get support from other early childhood professionals as well, whether you have you know, a situation in your classroom with another educator, how to handle those things. This is going to be a really great place for you to connect. So if you'd like to sign up, I'm going to uh, pop a link into the chat. Um, I'll put it at the chat. Oh, Rhea did it already. Yep. Hi, mama.com. It's the type form there. Um, we'll also put in the sticky note. So click that link, pop in your email address and your name, and we will send you out the link as soon as we have it launched. We're super, super excited about it. It's going to be great, folks. We want to make sure to have as many people in on that group as possible. Um, I did post the link. I think, Kai, you will repost. But I'm very excited to uh, to get this guy off the ground and be able to have a, another piece of community that we can interact on a day-to-day -day basis besides our, our uh, Thursday webinars, folks. So very excited. Please, uh, we'll send out more information as it rolls out. But um, today, let's get, let's get going. As always, uh, if you've never joined us before, just please remember that, um, A, I did not go to legal school. 
And um, I say legal school. This is why, guys, I did not go to law school. At the end of the day, uh, we're not here to give you sort of any legal or financial advice. Ideally, we want you guys to take away great tips, great tricks, um, places you can contact, things you can look up, resources you can use within your classroom, um, at home, wherever you may be. Okay, so we want to make sure that that's all covered. Uh, As always, Please don't ever think we aren't. We're always recording. So this will be recorded for you guys. If you have to duck out early, uh, I'm sad you're going to miss out, but you will be able to view everything. It's going to come out with the show notes as well as the certificate, as well as the slides. So you'll be able to access all of these great pieces. If you want to come back, uh, reference anything, it will all be in the show notes for you as well. The certificate will be made at the end, uh, sorry, made available at the end of the session today. And for those of you who potentially were with us last week and did catch my, my little boo-boo, I kept 2020 going last week and left it on the certificate. So if you did not get a chance to get yours updated, uh, it is out there. So please uh, don't be shy if you can't find it. But the certificate today does say 2021. We are finally in that era <laughs> at the end of the day. So uh, as always, uh, I'm Ria. I'm one of the early childhood educators here at Hi Mama. I'm the community ambassador. And if, by the way, folks, if you've never actually looked into Hi Mama, we are a childcare software. Um, we do have um, a variety of areas that we can help you out. So if you're looking for more information, we do have people you can talk to on the phone if you want to know more. If you're looking at setting us up or anything like that, a fantastic group of people here that um, I've all worked with as well. So. Um, I can even vouch for a couple of them in regards to they love some great jokes, like to have a great laugh with you and want to make sure that if you are looking to purchase Hi Mama, it's a great fit. So please let us know if you are interested in more. Kaya, as always, she's on on chat, my partner in crime. Here she is. Kaya, do you have a fun fact for us at all? As I kick as you kick off right away. I was <laughs> yeah, I was just I was actually just thinking about that. We haven't done fun facts in a while, but I guess my fun fact today is that I'm wearing the Hi Mama sweater. Our um our designer on our marketing team designed it, and that was our little Christmas present. So, it's so comfy. Um, yeah, it's so comfy. So that's a fun fact that uh, we got a little Christmas present from Hi Mama from our marketing team. Love it. All right, uh, folks. Questions as they come up. Kaya is on the chat, so make sure to send them her way, and she'll get them to me. Uh, our special guest today. Later on, we're going to bring her on a couple of minutes from now. Super excited to be talking with Alyssa. She's CEO at Seed and Sew. Phenomenal background, folks, in regards to emotional learning, emotional development, an author. She was on our podcast. If you haven't listened to our podcast with Ron, also does her own. At the end of the day, I feel like there's there's nothing she hasn't done at this point. So I'm super excited to have her on talking about this very important topic uh, for today. Uh, Karen, I'm sorry. We, we can't send out multiple sweaters. My apologies. But um, it, they are comfy. Um, Today, we we want you guys to take away a little bit more foundation on emotional intelligence. We want Meek's takeaways as well on the chat. Please don't be shy if you've had something that's worked really well for you, especially in those moments when, you know, we've all been in the parking lot trying to pull our hair out. But um, hopefully not. Guys, it's really long now. Let's start it off here. Want to talk a little bit more about emotional intelligence, more around the definition of it. Um, As an educator, we all know that... um, you know, emotional intelligence, it ties to so many different things. So that regulation, that stability for children, uh, Oxford languages, it says that you're, you know, you're aware of control, you express your emotions, ties back to that regulation piece. And it's how you, you work with your relationships and how you, you actually produce some empathy from it all. So I'm very excited to talk more in depth with Alyssa about this in a bit, but some of those impacts that it has. Um, we, we know at, that it's a huge piece in self-regulation for children. We know that it can be a piece that ties with motivation, you know, tie back to that empathy that I'd mentioned before, as well, their self-awareness and kind of that, their awareness of their physical being kind of it, and it goes along with that motivation too. And of course it ties in a lot with, um, with your social skills. You know, if, if we've all been in that classroom, uh, where, you know, the couple of younger preschoolers and they they tend to play around with each other's emotional and social skills. And they definitely make a lot of, you know, impact to see how their friends can react differently. But as well, it's it's how you react. And then, of course, it, it can label you that way. But on this, the other hand, we want to make sure that the children are able to label their emotions. So tell and talking more about it. So I actually want to dive into talking more about that emotional intelligence. 
with your children, with your classroom, with your children at home, whoever it is you may be. At the end of the day, uh, recognize and understand. This is a huge one. And, and I think it stems from, there's so many places that this ties back with, but understanding why a child is acting the way they are and really looking at the background of what's triggered those emotions, that behavior, they tie really well together. And, and as well, noticing cues from body. So I've seen this in a couple of the children I work very closely with who, um, you know, they tended to have very, I want to say large breakouts, like anger breakouts. And prior to those, I noticed they, they would generally, and this, these particular children I'm thinking of, squeeze and get very tense, like they're ready to beat you up. And, but it came out verbally. So at least it, there was no physical harm, but it came out very verbally. And they very much were noting how they were feeling. So working on a lot of, okay, I see you're mad what, and going from there. And that's a huge piece of being able to, to label that and build on why, why are you mad? And, and sometimes they can't tell us those things. Sometimes they can't even label it. We all know, um, besides maybe a biting one, a toddler has usually three emotions, which is happy, sad, or mad, and maybe biting, hopefully not. Hopefully you're not in that classroom and that's, uh, that's the case. Um, we know in the English language, there's over 2000 types of different emotions, labeled emotions. And so doing our best to just enrich a child's vocabulary and applying those to those emotions. And it's not easy either. That is for sure. It's definitely not an easy thing. And, you know, we set them up for success when learning how to emotionally regulate themselves. So talking about that expression, we want to make sure to give them out in different ways. So one of, um, one of the key things I actually used when I was working in my classroom specifically was uh, we used to do this thing throughout our circle time where I had, I want to say it was like seven or eight different popsicle sticks with different faces on them so that the child could label how they felt in that moment. And it started doing it throughout the day as well, so that this way they could not only label it with a picture to help express what they're saying, but as well teach them the language that could go with that. I had a little label on the back, just, you know, it, just in case I need it, knowing what it was. Um, so that this way it would allow them to tell me how they were feeling at the time. And a lot of this is, you know, I was working with children who were coming out with their language. They were just getting, to that brink of full conversation. Some of them had great conversation skills. Some of them were still working with it. So being able to say things like, I feel angry when you knock over my block of towers, those sorts of things, being able to help them label that was a huge piece of what I did on a day-to-day. -day. And a lot of people on the chat right now saying the same thing. Just as a reminder, folks, too, if you're having some trouble with the connection, we are, um, we are looking into different um, platforms. To give you guys a better viewing experience, please just reconnect. Hit the reconnect button on the top and it should should work for you. You might have to do it more than once, but folks, we are working towards that, hopefully coming very, very soon. I can't just I can't say yet. Looking at regulate, this ties back to what we were talking about earlier. You want to be able to instill them for both, you know, long and short term strategies so that they can work through managing those emotions whether it's um, starting with seeking support so that and turning to their friends, turning to their teachers, learning to, you know, handle them as an example of taking those deep breaths, depending, this all is, of course, age appropriate, right? You have to work with what your ages are. We want to make sure that you're teaching those skills and getting them, instilling them in them that they can actually, you know, center themselves, right? Enough said here, folks, I've been waiting all week for this. I'm so excited. I want to make sure to give her the big welcome that she deserves. Lisa, you can join us now, please, my dear CEO of Seed and Sew. She was on our podcast. I'm so excited. When I was reading your bio, I just got so passionate about what you do, and I'm not you. So I, the passion that must come from you, I cannot wait. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I get to do my dream job, which is pretty rad on a daily basis. <laughs> yeah. It's exciting. I, okay, let's start with a little bit about you and a little bit about um, like Seed and Sew and what you guys do over there. Totally. Um, so my master's is in early childhood and I've worked in early ed in a number of different ways. I was a director of a child care center. I was a nanny. I taught 
kindergarten, preschool, pre-K. I kept getting younger. I was like, oh, I wish I had this kid as a toddler. <laughs> and then I went into the teaching toddlers and I was like, ah, I wish I had him as an infant. I could really shape these skills. And <laughs> so I kept getting younger and younger and have now taught between birth to five uh, plus kindergarten. And I, while I was teaching, I had the opportunity to work at a school that was really resource rich. And um, we were able to do research on kiddos if we wanted to. We were partnered with the university. And yeah, it was really lovely. And I connected with a colleague and we ended up creating the collaborative emotion processing method. We call it the STEP method, C-E-P. And we researched it across the U.S. and actually wrote a book on it that we just submitted to publishers this week. So fingers oh, crossed. That's exciting. Um, yeah. Yeah. And really what we were looking at here was how do we build emotional intelligence in the tiny human? So much of what we were exposed to at that time was social emotional curriculum was heavily social. It was how do we have kids who can engage with each other, who can ask things kindly, who can navigate a space with other humans and before we can work on social skills, you have to have uh, sensory and emotional regulation skills and the self-awareness to know like, ooh, I feel this in my body before I even can say the words for what I'm feeling, I recognize I'm having a feeling. Um, and so we started to really dive into this and read the research that was available, looking for, we were like, maybe there is something out there that is doing what we want and we could just like adopt that program and we couldn't find it so we created it and now through seed um we have a number of programs working both with teachers in early ed and providers and then also with parents uh to support folks in building these tools with the tiny humans that that's wonderful that's <laughs> absolutely amazing. when you, you said like that you're right on that's rad that is amazing so with seed can you like um do you guys teach it and then like send it out to a center that you potentially are working with? How does that work for setting it up if somebody's potentially looking at getting into it? Yeah, for sure. So if you're a teacher or you're a provider, you're working in childcare, we have a seed certification program. So we, I collaborated with four other experts in the field of early ed, occupational therapists, speech language pathologists, psychologists, um, and another gal with a master's in early ed who's doing her PhD now. And we put together eight workshops. Um, it was it's really like my dream professional development as a teacher. <laughs> I was like, oh, I want to put together what I always wanted. And it guides you through both how to do this work. It's uh, eight different workshops, really diving into the adult components, adult self-awareness and bias work and connecting with families who have diverse backgrounds from maybe our background, um, anti-racist classroom support, anti-bias curriculum for anti-racist classrooms, um, the regulation component from an occupational therapist, uh, our speech language pathologist dives into language and how it connects to regulation and the ability even to say, I feel angry. What does it take for the brain to even be able to say that? Mm -hmm. um, and how can we set kids up for success? And then there's a number of workshops from me in there on the emotion coaching for emotion processing and boundaries and discipline, visual aid stuff within the classroom to support this work. So if you are in, um, Childcare. It's seedschools.org. You can go right there, and you can. There's a teacher certification, and then there's school certifications as well. That I I want to do it now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> My whole team like loved putting it together. They were like, "You're so fun to watch." <laughs> I yeah. love it, and I'm sure you guys get a lot of passionate teachers as well coming into it. It, it you were set up for some amazing success there. So let's dive in. Uh, of course, you know, a hot topic of the last year, probably this year, sadly, will be the pandemic. We all kind of know that one's coming it, over right now. What you've seen, maybe what's been the top concern, whether it's from parents, teachers, whoever, what's been the top concern right now around children's emotional development as uh, over last year and as we, we do go into this year? Yeah, we hear a lot of, from an emotional development perspective, fear of what the impacts will be in terms of like, is my kid lonely at home? Am I able to provide them at home with the same social interaction that they would get at school or with peers? And a lot of fear around if I can't, what does that look like? Um, or even in schools with different regulations happening right now, um, what are the impacts on emotional development? 
And then when we get younger, we've heard a lot of concerns around the connection between language and emotional development. If a teacher is wearing a mask all day and kids are trying to build language and emotional development skills so much is happens by reading a person's face, that if we can't see that face, how does that affect emotional development? Those are some big concerns that we've heard from folks. And that's totally fair, especially with um, it, taking going to those young ones, like whether the infants or toddlers are coming into that toddler area when they mm -hmm. are learning to really start expressing themselves because they like you said, they you learn a lot from the face, especially as an infant. So going into that toddler phase, which is, I feel like been the most area of concern around emotional development um, and with the older children, that lonely aspect. But there's a lot happening around there. Do you feel like do you feel like you will see an impact because of this on children's emotional development, like from years to from now? Or do you think it might level out as hopefully we start to, you know, calm, COVID calm down and, you know, return to a bit of normalcy? Yeah, I'm not super concerned about the long term ramifications here, to be honest. Um, I think the greatest thing we can do right now is support parents' emotional development and teachers' emotional development who are at home uh, and or in school with kiddos because how we show up with them we know is going to be a game changer for how they show up in the world and whether or not they feel safe and secure and can thrive is is they're going to feed off of our mirror neurons and um so working we've been working so much on adult self-regulation i actually have a free adult self-regulation challenge next week like guiding adults through doing this work so that we can lower our own cortisol levels and all that jazz but i think that that'll be a huge part of not just now, but going forward for these tiny humans, is that they have regulated caregivers. And if we can take care of the adults, uh, then the adults are better able to show up for the tiny humans. That is totally true, because we do so much, so much teaching through modeling, that if we're not in control of ourselves, it's very hard to teach the children how to, to do that for themselves, right? Like we have to be <laughs> in the right state, which it's, it's not, you know, many of us can say we're not there right now. So it's it's a hard time for everybody. Yeah. So what's talking about teachers, maybe uh, next to supporting children, especially with like the mask and everything like that, maybe what's your next biggest challenge that you've seen them having over the last year or heard Just, or yeah. Yeah. So much focus on new regulations and the time that goes into these regulations, whether it's sanitizing things all day long, all that just it's pulling you away from the interactions with the kids. And we already know as early childhood educators, so often there aren't enough of us in a classroom anyway, and we're doing so many tasks that pull us away from kids. And that list just got longer. And so that I think for a lot of early childhood educators feels overwhelming and just not fun, really. Like, it's not why we're doing this work. We're in that classroom because we want to connect with those kiddos. And it's a real bummer to spend a nice chunk of it sanitizing toys. I, yeah, 100% agree that the, and I'm not actually surprised. And a couple of people in the chat have mentioned that already, that it's definitely taking away from their interactions. And uh, it, it it's definitely maybe, it's making an impact, a positive and a negative impact, I'm sure. But um, it's definitely something that's been highlighted throughout the last several webinars we've talked about, actually. So as, um, as I mentioned before, in this our case right now here in Ontario, we just went into another state of emergency and we've had a lot of places where, you know, some centers open, some centers closed, uh, you know, our school age children are not going back to school until at least February now at this point, at least for us. I know it's different across the board, but maybe as children potentially, depending on their situation, do return to a classroom, whether they've been out for a long time or maybe off for two weeks or whatever. Do you have any advice for teachers as they do come back for potentially emotional or behavioral challenges that they could see after being away for such a long time, potentially? Totally. I mean, I, I even remember we the last school that I was at, we had the break between like Christmas and New Year's was off. And I just remember like dreading coming back in those early January days because you're like, I know they're going to be dysregulated, right? Like the transition back in from home, just like with families, they're like, oh, when we transition back from vacation, et cetera the transitions are tough and really what it is is the kid is designed to push the boundaries to say is this still the rule now is this still the expectation now and if we are a safe place for them to break down to then they will open up those emotions for us which is what we want and it's draining and it's hard to be that space for one kid it's really hard to be that space for like eight nine plus 18 kids depending on the um size of your classroom. And so 
Uh, some things that I find really helpful with the tiny humans, I often refer to them as tiny humans, you'll hear this, because, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> I want to keep in mind that they are humans, they're just smaller, but they have nervous systems, they have emotions, uh, they are navigating life as well, and um, so anyway, with the tiny humans, a few things that I find really helpful, a visual aid that will help them transition back in, whether it's um, a book we in the seed cert we provide our teachers with like a transition book that they can customize and send to families that the families can be reading at home about like who the teacher is what the classroom looks like what the protocols might be so that as kids are coming back they know what to expect there and can work hand in hand with families and then having um, visual schedules at school to be able to reference and go through and then ultimately allowing kids to have those hard emotions. And that's a conversation we'll also have with parents. My parents knew when they dropped their kiddos off in my classroom, I wasn't going to make them stop crying for our comfort. I wasn't going to distract them out of those feelings. And that that's really hard to watch. It's really hard to walk away as a parent when your kid is crying and you're dropping them off. And we want to let these parents know ahead of time that they might walk away and their kids crying and we will support them. We will not rush that feeling away though. We will let them know it's okay to feel sad. You've been home with your parents and now it's different. Now we're back at school and sometimes it's hard to come back. I think of myself leaving vacation. I cry leaving yeah. vacation every time, <laughs> right? Like, I don't want to go. And like, come on, man, we're doing the same thing with these tiny humans. I want to hold that space and let them know it's okay to feel this. Uh, you don't have to rush it or make it go away. We're not in the game to fix emotions. I, I think as a lot of like parents, especially maybe in some educators as well, we do rush in trying to get them out of that emotion. And it, it's, I think, been a mantra for, for definitely 2020 where it's, it's, it's okay to feel that way. And I feel like a lot of, a lot of us have started to realize that, that it is more of that and that we shouldn't be letting it go as quickly as possible, that it's okay to feel it. And I, I think one of the things I learned it's okay to feel it, just don't continue to live it. And, uh, and it's, taking, it's not taking it to the next day, potentially, if it's something that bothered you one day from work as an adult. But the same thing for the children. It, it's, you, you've said it, they're tiny humans. They feel what we feel, and they just don't know how to express it. And so it's basically the same sort of situation. Why do we have to rush them out of feeling that way when we're allowed to stay that way? It's, mm -hmm. it's definitely a really big key. So with all that said, have you seen or talked with any parents or teachers who are, you know, looking for a potential where a child's, let's say, past a point, a breaking point, they're in a bit of emotional distress, or maybe they're mm -hmm. in deep in it? Do you have any like, go to signs or I don't want to say symptoms, but for lack of a better term, symptoms around that, that teachers could be looking at, especially if, if a child has been off for a really long time. And, and I know a lot of centers, they do support areas that you know, maybe it's a lower income family area or potentially, you know, we have a single mom, single dad, some sort of situation where it's not maybe an ideal home situation or it's a rougher life situation that they should be looking out for as they either return to school or return to the childcare, wherever it is they're, they're coming back to. Yeah. So these are two different categories for me. One, you're talking about kids who have high ACEs, the adverse childhood experiences. Um, and we, while we're going to approach them similarly, kids with ACEs, I'm going to have um, a, a bit of a twist to this, we'll say. Yeah. But if we're looking at um, kids who are navigating dysregulation, as so many of us are, we, I have a whole, I'm doing five webinars, same webinar, five different times in different days coming up in a few weeks specifically on kids self-regulation because we're getting so many of these questions. You know, we're doing the adult self-reg first and then we're like, all right, now what does this look like for kids? If people are interested in that, you can follow feed and, and come join us and it, you can access totally free um, to dive into that. But to give you a snapshot into this, when we're looking at regulation, we're looking at sensory regulation first, which is your central nervous system. Before we can work on emotional regulation, we have to regulate the nervous system. And the nervous system has, we're going to look at like the red zone, which we all know is like that distress. It, that kid is fully out of control, needs co-regulation, could not regulate on their own in that moment. Um, that's actually quite rare, uh, but that's what we're trying to avoid. And then we have the yellow, which is right under that red, which 
we all cycle into. It's like, oh, I'm feeling excited or I'm nervous or I have butterflies or it could be I'm getting frustrated. I'm getting angry. And the, the goal is not to stay in what's below that is the green, which is like regulated, calm, chill, content. Nobody lives in that zone all day long. We all cycle up and then down below that green, we have a blue, which is when kids are going to pull back, they're going to dissociate and they'll disconnect. And we all kind of cycle between that green, yellow, and blue throughout the day. That's the goal of our nervous system is to be able to have peaks and then kind of come down and hang out and maybe have a little valley and go back up, really trying to avoid that red. And so for kiddos, what we're looking at is how do we help proactively support their nervous system? And then what do we do in the moment? When we're looking proactively, we think of it as a sensory bank that we all have um things that are going to pull from our bank, withdrawals that are going to happen, whether it's the transition back into school, or uh, it might just be that you're hungry or a little tired, or maybe it's the lights, the sounds, the way your clothes feel. It could be that your body needs to move. Uh, and so these things are going to happen all day long, these withdrawals. And we want to pour deposits in also throughout the day so that there's something to pull from. What we look at here, we work with OTs a lot around this work, is proprioceptive input, which is like big body play, making sure that they are able to engage those muscle groups every 90 minutes to two hours throughout the day. For me in my classroom, it would be like, all right, we're gonna have a dance party. And then there might be a kid who needs some vestibular input, which is like spinning. And so that kid, I would make sure I'm like spinning them in our dance party, right? Um, but really looking at getting this movement in every couple hours is huge for pouring into that sensory regulation, um, which is gonna play a huge role in their ability to show up as a more regulated human. That's our proactive work. And then in the moment, the emotion coaching and co-regulating is gonna be huge. And I will, like I said, I have a full hour workshop on how to do this coming up, um, but there's a little snapshot into what that looks like. That That's a fantastic answer. Like uh, at this point right now, it's it's, almost like we all know just how much of an impact that sensory can have no matter what it is you're doing on a child's everything like there's there's so many things even as adults like I definitely like I fidget during a meeting and I know very well that I have to fidget during a meeting and that I need it to pay attention because otherwise I won't so it's fantastic so jumping from that my next question is talking a little bit more about you know we've we've had a lot of, you know, ups and downs over the last year, we've had a lot of, you know, we're very concerned, obviously, we're concerned coming into this year. Have you heard potentially, or if you had any good moments that have come from all of this that, you know, whether it's from yourself, a teacher, a parent, um, is there anything that, you know, that's positive that you found that's being influenced because of this? Yeah, for sure. Um, absolutely. I mean, it's really easy to look at whoa, all of the hardship from this last year. Um, but there have absolutely been some some great things. I mean, a lot of families reaching out who, while they are feeling a little depleted and overwhelmed with the task of full time, um, who have also got to see milestones or be present to their tiny humans in ways that maybe they couldn't have before that wasn't afforded to them before. And so I think that's huge. Um, and really, I think the acknowledgement of the village <laughs> that I, I know as an early childhood educator for myself, so often I felt undervalued and I was like, oh, it's hard for you at home with your two kids. Come into my classroom of nine toddlers, <laughs> right? Like, and wanted them to like see me in a way that I often didn't feel seen. And I think right now, early childhood educators are so seen. <laughs> I think parents are like, holy moly, how have you been doing this? Why did you choose this job? And, <laughs> and I think that that's going to be really awesome too for the long term in terms of collaborating with parents. And I, I hope that we can use this going forward as a way to kind of bridge that homeschool connection in a new way. I I agree 100% that the light that's being shed now on ed early education, especially uh, the education system as a whole as well, but very much on the early ed has been huge. And I'm so happy to see it. And I hope that I want to say push for the big movements to get the things that we want. And now is the time to do so as well as 
those connections with the families. Like you said, it's the, you do want to be seen. You want parents to see what's going on as well as, um, you know, have them meet you at the same level as well. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's the value too. And, and last week um, we had Beth Cannon on and, and she was talking about, you know, where our value is worth more than our, uh, our weight. And it was a phenomenal, phenomenal, not like just the analogy in a way it came out it was amazing. Um, so it, it, it rings for me right now with what you're saying. So it was mm-hmm. fantastic. Um, so talking about that, talking about as we fight the pandemic and wanting to give, you know, the best for our little humans, they're the, like you yeah. said, they're the little humans. Do you have like any advice for parents and teachers to work together and, and do provide the best? Is there anything that you've seen working really well um, over the last year that you guys have put in place? Yeah. Um, uh, Self care. I think this was something that, like, so often we push to the one of the five components of the step method is self care. Um, and it's the one that people are often like, yeah, 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 when I get to it. <laughs> and the reality is that self care for us is about regulating the nervous system. It's saying, I'm going to drink enough water today. I'm going to go to the bathroom when I need to without a kid on my body. I'm going to eat my food. I'm going to move my body or I'm going to set boundaries for my body and say, you know what? My body needs a little break from somebody on it right now. I'm happy to read this book with you. I'll sit next to you. Um, and really taking care of ourselves, of our central nervous system, I think is something that we were forced into this year with so much dysregulation. Anytime we're looking at things like anxiety, anytime somebody's stuck in an emotion, really what that means to us is that you are stuck in a cortisol or adrenaline loop um, where you are not able to regulate your nervous system at that moment. And when this is why we can't do emotional regulation without sensory regulation, we're going to come back to what do you need to regulate your nervous system? What do you need for self-care? And this is something that I think also in our field within early ed has always been pushed to the back burner. I know I was terrible at it as a teacher. I would have 8,000 kids on my body and be like, yeah, yeah, I can take on that task. Or like, no, this is fine. I can eat with a kid on my body for lunch. Um, you know, I think so often we're like giving of ourselves. It's like the giving tree and then there's nothing left to give. And this year forced us to take care of ourselves because we had to for survival and we were really forced into that. And I hope that it's something that going forward, we continue to do that. We continue to say, what are my needs? How do I take care of myself so that I can show up as the most regulated human I can? A hundred percent. It's, I even was there like you, I sat in there and the same thing, you know, you've got 80 million children hanging off you and you're like, yeah, I can do that. Um, But the same side, the, the time I took for myself at learning it, learning to take time for myself has probably been the hardest part for me um, as yeah. an educator. It's it's not something you easily do, you easily give up, or you easily and instilling it the way we've had to over the course of this year has been um, it, unreal. It's been amazing. So I think as well, directors potentially are seeing oh the importance behind it of having those, whether it's a mental health day. Uh, whatever it may be, it's a huge piece that I hope comes forth, taken from 2020 and it moves forward and it it drives that momentum. So um, I want to go back because you were talking about toddlers. I know you said you've worked in toddler, you've worked in all ages, but especially the toddlers with the fact that infants, young toddlers, you know, a lot, we get a lot of nonverbal. So maybe unrelated to COVID in the instance, what would be potentially any tips, tricks, techniques that you would give with helping with emotional development, developing that emotional intelligence for whether teacher or parent. Yeah, Um, I have a podcast episode that dives into infant toddler specific emotional regulation. Um, I think it's episode 102, 103, 104. I'm like terrible at knowing my own podcast numbers. Um, Once you get over 100, I'm like, ah, one of those. Um, But if (laughs) podcast people are interested. But what I, so infant toddler is like my, if I could hang out with a one-year-old, like that's my jam all day. And when we researched the step method, we started, our kiddos were as young as four months up through five years old. And what was so cool to see was how young kids can build these skills. I, when we were working on it with our infants, we then had kids who 
by nine months, it started at four months, by nine months could crawl over to a coping strategies board, which is just, I use like a piece of cardboard from an Amazon box with Velcro strips and put um, visuals of coping strategies on there. And they could pull off the coping strategy they needed at that moment before they had the verbal language to communicate with us. So I think expecting more from infants and toddlers, actually, I think we often don't expect as much from them. And then they get to like three and four and we expect so much. We're like, tell me when you're angry, regulate your nervous system, communicate kindly, share with love and intention and compassion. And we haven't built these skills. And infant toddlers are time for building these skills. And I think when we can like shift that focus and say, they are humans, they are tiny humans, and I'm going to communicate with them as though they do understand me, that I am going to say, oh, man, you really want to reach that block. And every time you push, your body goes backwards instead of forward. Oh, man, it's so hard to learn how to crawl, right? Like when I can communicate with them as though they're a real human, um, they will respond. I'm there. I'm letting them know I see you. I'm letting them know with my tone. I'm letting them know with my facial expression that I see you and I understand what you're going through. Even before they can understand the verbal language, they're going to know that I get it and they're going to feel connected and we're going to move through these things together. So us being able to self-regulate so that we can connect with these kiddos and communicate with them with intention is so huge. We had kids who before too were coming up and saying things to me like, hey, I I had this I had this little girl who, oh my gosh, she just came into my head. She, I was like, oh babe, you are so mad that this person had taken her spatula and run away. Man, you're so mad. They took your spatula and ran away. You were playing with that. And she said, I'm not mad. I'm frustrated. <laughs> and she wasn't even two yet. But we've been doing this work. I, I, she had wrapped with me. I had her as an infant. And then I had her as a toddler. And she was okay. like 22 months or so. And so we've been doing this work as long as I, I got her at nine months old. And I was like, gosh, this is so rad to see how much they are capable of and what they can build when we can support that nervous system so they can access that whole brain and we can teach these skills to them on just such a basic level of connection, like really, truly just connecting with them first. That is absolutely phenomenal. I, I can hear her and I haven't even met her saying I'm frustrated, like just from... Yeah, it's that is amazing. And I, I think I think you're totally right. You nailed it so much. Like I feel like we maybe don't put as much into like we we do put a lot into development at the infant age, but we I think we definitely put more emphasis on it in different areas and being able to actually let them know that they can still communicate at that age in different ways, I think is huge. And then you're right, at, at they get to that, you know, that three, four, and it's like, okay, you need to be able to do this, this, and this but you weren't like, we have to start from scratch because it potentially wasn't given right away or it was started, but then changed technique, anything like that right. is, is a huge thing. So when it comes to potentially that, that frustrating moment, let's say whether it's in the car, you know, parking lot at Target or it's, you know, in the grocery store or it's in the classroom and they're having that moment of just absolute, you know, as a teacher, you're ready to pull your hair out. Any tips around that for parents or teachers? Sorry, you cut out for a minute on oh. me there. Can you just repeat that question? That's okay. Any tips or techniques to use around that really frustrating moment, no matter where you are, parking lot or in oh, the yeah. room? <laughs> <Totally. laughs> so, I mean, this is parking right, lot. Right? This is <laughs> right. um, first and foremost is recognizing mirror neurons and the role that they play here. That, you know, that like delicious laugh from a baby that just like fills you with joy. You can't help but laugh or smile because your body is mirroring their neurons. We're now both producing oxytocin, that feel good love hormone. And it's rad. The same thing happens when that kid drops to the ground in the parking lot and is screaming or on the playground and won't leave. Their body produces adrenaline or cortisol. And then your body mirrors that. That's how science works. That's the neuroscience of it. And it's our job to bring the calm. It's not a child's job to get calm for us. It's our job to get calm for them, which is a real bummer and really hard to do in the moment. And 
it's crucial for us being able to move through this. That if we are stuck in that cortisol loop with them, oh man, there's just like no winning. And so if you can like Zero. pause and even, it, it doesn't take a long time to pause the production of cortisol in your body and to start to produce serotonin and dopamine, which are gonna calm the nervous system. If you can take five deep breaths even, and just pause as long as somebody's safe, even if you have to hold a child while you do this to regulate your nervous system, then you can go right into connecting with them. And we might still, we might not solve the problem in the parking lot. It might be me saying, I recognize you really wanted to go back into the store. You didn't feel done in there. We have to get to the doctors. Would you like me to carry you to the car or would you like to walk? And then I'm going to let them know my timeline expectation. I'm going to count to 10 or I'm going to count to five and then I'll carry you. Knowing that it's okay if this feeling isn't done in the parking lot. That our, again, my job is not to fix feelings. It's not to rush them. It's to give kids the space to feel and to process. And that's not going to happen on our timeline all the time. And so especially, I, I think we see this a lot in transitions where we have a timeline and that's fair. We can hold boundaries and stick to that timeline. And we can't expect kids to process emotions on that timeline. And so sometimes it's going to be me carrying a child who's crying in from the playground, and we're going to finish this inside. Um, or it's into the car seat, and we I'm going to give them time and space in the car to regulate, and then we're going to connect when they are ready. Uh, but it's not our job to decide the timeline. I, I love it. Alyssa, this has been fantastic. I, I think I'm going to definitely take a lot of that, put it in my back pocket for, for future years because it, it's definitely a huge resonating piece, especially that reminder of it's not on our time and to make sure that we're letting them feel what they need to feel and then work with them to, to move from that. But it's been amazing having you on. Any Before we go to Q&A, any pieces of advice, happy thoughts, anything you want to leave us with today? Um, at, whether it's parent, teacher, educator, whoever it may be, anything you want to leave us with? Yeah, I think largely just that it's not about perfection, that we are going to leave each day being like, man, and we do this as teachers all the time where we do reflective practice. We look back and say, all right, what went really well in that morning circle time or in that morning transition? And what might we need, we need to tweak? But part of that is saying, it's okay if I make mistakes that I'm not going to leave as a, I've never left a day and been like, Alyssa, you were perfect all day today. Like that's never happened. It's never going to. And I think a huge part of this is giving ourselves grace, letting ourselves make mistakes and say, I get to enter into repair with kids or I get to try again and model that for them, that we make mistakes too and we can enter into repair. Fantastic. I Okay, we have a couple of just one or two questions here that we wanted to get through. I'm just I'm looking through them to make sure that we haven't covered as we go here as well. We have noticed there's been a couple of ups and downs on the chat today. So folks, we, we have seen that. Don't worry, we have been on the back. Kai has been doing her best to make sure it's going through. But it, um, if you wanted to actually elaborate for me a little bit about your upcoming one, well, just scanning the, all the great questions yeah. that are coming through. Elaborate a little bit more about the upcoming webinars you guys have prepared for everybody. Totally. Um, yeah, so we have our adult self-reg challenge starts on Monday. Folks can go right to www.cdco.org slash challenge. It's totally free. And I am dropping in with a video Monday through Friday to guide you as the adult through what does this look like on a day-to-day -day basis for like one week span. There's some freebies and stuff in there too, free downloads to support you, all that jazz. Um, and then after we finish that week, then the last week of January and the first week of February, I'm going to do some webinars to talk about the kids. So what does this look like to support them? And they'll be an hour long each. I always will stay and answer questions if that goes over, goes over. And folks will have access to the recording for 24 hours. Um, but if people want to sign up for those, that'll be live. The sign up's go live next week. So at the end of the challenge, then you'll be able to, no, I'm sorry, at the, on Tuesday next week. Um, so in the middle of the challenge, we'll then link to that. But first, we wanted to get people into the adult self-reg, and then we'll move on to kids. 
Um, and everything can always be accessed from seasonso.org. We try to keep that banner at the top of our website updated with whatever like free thing we have going on at the time. If you wanted to sign up, you can always head there and just click on the banner. Awesome. Awesome. I will do so. Okay. We got a couple of questions that have come through. So I'm going to jump a little bit here and there, but we had one particular question here. And of course, why do I always just like lose them when I'm looking for them? So <laughs> I don't really want them, right? Okay, That's so right. it was any tips around supporting families, um, whether it be online or through delivery, um, who've been closed potentially since last March. This one in particular is talking about last March, um, as well as going back into opening, um, supporting those families, obviously, emotionally, and making sure the kiddos are, are as good to go as they come back in. Yeah, totally. I would really be focusing on the nervous system regulation. So giving parents some tools for what they can do at home with kiddos. Remember, they didn't go to school for this, right? Um, they don't have a degree in this. This is, this is our game. And so supporting them with what does that look like? I even had a parent last spring who reached out and was like, I don't even know like what the schedule for the day should look like, right? So many of these things that for us as early childhood educators, it's just par for the course. This is what we do. It's how our day to day looks. And we have a consistent routine. Being able to fill parents in with here are some activities that you can do every couple hours to help calm that kiddo's nervous system. Or um, here are some things that you can prep them with before school starts. So letting them know, on a ca like having a calendar that shows what today is when school starts, and so that they can mark off each day knowing when it's coming as many visual aids as we can give kids for the transition is huge. Just like I have a shopping list, I have a calendar, I have a clock, I have so many visual aids around me that help me function. I want to give that same gift to kids, especially if we're going to be coming back into school, navigating any sort of transition so that they know when it's coming um, and what to expect. Awesome. Alyssa, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on today. I have enjoyed every minute of this from one educator to the other. I love hearing the passion that you have just and the experience you have behind you. Like there, you're not just saying this for because you've read it somewhere. Like you actually have lived it, it's, yeah. which we all have, but at some point, but for the most part from the chat, from what came through. And once again, I do apologize. We had some ups and downs with the chat, but a lot of love from the chat for you as well. So That's I want you to know great. that almost 2000 people have been on this channel at some point here. So Thank you so much for being a part of our webinar series, uh, for being here today, for being on our podcast. Folks, if you haven't heard, um, we had her on with Ron. Uh, I haven't heard it yet, but I'm very excited to listen to it. It's on my to-do list. And, and thank you for all the amazing resources that you've, you've mentioned here today. We'll make sure to get them out. Folks, connect with Alyssa. There's a lot happening here. There's a lot. <laughs> That's so sweet. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, come on over to Instagram too. I hang out there every day and we provide free tools over there. It's my like favorite platform to connect. There you go, folks. We've heard it. We'll make sure to connect you up with um, with her at Facebook, with you, your podcast, as well as ours, as well as Instagram. To make sure anybody who's looking for it in the show notes. Thank you. Alyssa, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, Let's thanks jump for in. Having me. Some wrap up here for you guys, uh, folks, the um, the certificate has been uh, made available. I'm just making my thumbnail a little smaller for you here. It is in the files section. Uh, I had a saw a couple questions come through. The slides will be made available. All of them uh, will be made available with the show notes uh, tomorrow. You'll get them in your inbox. So go ahead, travel on down to the file section, download that certificate as a PDF. So you can pop your name in your center name, whatever's going on. Um, and if not, chance to get it today it will be with the show notes tomorrow so don't feel like you'll miss out on that end uh next week folks i'm super super jammed for this one as well uh, we're talking a little bit more about virtual learning uh, especially with just the way things have been going these days a lot more around um you know implementing it especially at centers and things like that and we've got a couple of great people who that that's what they did and i'm super excited to bring them on so watch out for registration to go up on monday uh, for next Thursday, same time, same place as always. And uh, to wrap up, make sure once again, if you haven't, Alyssa's podcast, both her own, ours, make sure that uh, you give it a listen. It's fantastic. Um, from what I've, I've only read, I read like the briefs on it, folks. So that's, that's as far as I got. Uh, check out us, whether you're following us on Instagram, whether you're following us on Facebook, if you want to learn more, please check out HiMama.com if you want to learn more about specifically Hi Mama. Um, we'd love to chat with you a little bit further. Um, as always, everybody, 
we're smack on time today. Kai, I did. We were like right on the ball. <laughs> we did it. Great work, Ria yeah, and uh, Alyssa. No, I think you're good. You got it all covered. Cool. Alyssa, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I've loved having her on like our podcast and our webinars. It's been phenomenal working with her. So I popped in uh, the links for, for her website, uh, seedandso.org. That's S-E-W dot org. Um, she's on uh, Instagram and Facebook. We've put the links in there and they will also be available in the show notes. Um, lots of resources there. So highly encourage you to check them out. And her podcast just went live on Tuesday. So definitely give it a listen. It's a great resource too. Awesome. Everybody, uh, once again, Alyssa, thank you for joining us. Kaya, as always, for being on chat. Thank you for being here. Stay healthy, stay happy from everyone at Hi Mama, and we'll see you next Thursday. Bye, everybody.